I've noticed that many people seem to have the idea that the Tibetan writing system is this super crazy inconsistent mess, in particular because its spellings, when converted into the Latin alphabet, often do not seem to line up with the pronunciations in a way which we are used to. When you write out in Latin characters the most canonical direct transliteration of a word like com, an example that you have perhaps seen before, it certainly seems like a strange system to use. I'm sure you can find many other examples online, however, I think if you just point out some examples of transliterations not acting like they would had they been written in the Latin alphabet, and saying, haha, that's super weird, then it's very easy to make the system seem much more complicated than it actually is. It's widely known that the reason for Tibetan's strange spelling is that it has been using the same spellings for a thousand years, during which time its phonology has changed quite a bit, but I typically only see this brought up as a way to explain why the system is bad, rather than as a way to understand why the system is not. In my opinion, when you approach the writing system as a literal representation of the sounds of an old language that has phonetically evolved to differ from the original, these weird inconsistencies make complete sense and aren't anything difficult to remember as far as reading is concerned. So what I want to do with this video is give some insight into the logic of the modern Tibetan writing system from this perspective of phonetic evolution. What I'll do first is give a snapshot of how the Tibetan script worked in Old Tibetan around when it was first created, then I'll go through the modern Tibetan syllable and use its apparent idiosyncrasies as examples to see how Tibetan's phonology has changed since the script's creation. Then I'll talk a little bit about some interesting ramifications that this phonological evolution and writing system has had on how the language operates today. The Tibetan alphabet consists of 30 radicals, shown on the screen, each representing an initial consonant with a root vowel. Like the Indic alphabets, the default vowel for each character is a, ah, and diacritics written around the radical can mark a different vowel. This is the modern Tibetan alphabet, but I'm not going to say anything about it until after I've talked about Old Tibetan phonology. I'm showing it now to let you know what to expect, and to assert that this modern alphabet and the Old Tibetan alphabet, shown now, are identical in form. They use the same characters, carrying different pronunciations. Now as a preface to a discussion of Old Tibetan phonology, I will say that we don't know for sure how Old Tibetan was spoken but based on how the alphabet is traditionally presented, which mirrors the Indic alphabets on which it was based, as well as how it evolved, we can make some pretty good guesses. The majority of this video is pulled from the writings of Nathan Hill and Stephen Mayer. They do have some disagreements, and I'll try to point out where these lie when we come to the appropriate place. The traditional story is that this original script was created by a minister of some old king in the 7th century, who was sent to India with the goal of bringing back the ability to write for the purpose of translating Sanskrit texts into Tibetan. There is some contention here, some think that this was actually created earlier and this guy just standardized it at most, but that doesn't really matter. What you're looking at is not the very earliest script, the Wa character actually evolved from a diagraph of two different characters, but this is nevertheless a very early version of the alphabet, and again, one that corresponds in form with the modern. Like the Indic scripts on which it was based, this script is arranged by place and type of articulation. On the first four rows, there are voiceless unaspirated consonants on the far left, then voiceless aspirated consonants to the right of those, and voiced consonants to the right of those. When I say aspiration, I'm referring to the puff of air that comes out of your mouth when you say stop consonants. This is marked by the H character. Often English speakers aspirate the labial stop P in the word pit, but not in spit. Pronounce these words and see if you have a puff of air in the former if you don't know what aspiration is. If you're still confused about this or any other phonological terms that I use in this video, I recommend you look up a guide to IPA or International Phonetic Alphabet, or just transcribe whatever I say into Wikipedia and there will probably be a page for it there. I'm not going to be explaining too much of that stuff here to keep this video shorter. And of course there are nasals to the right of all the stops. This column row manner and place of articulation distinction only really applies to the first five rows. Below those are some more consonants that don't fit into the above voicing aspiration distinctions. A few characters require some special mention. First, the series of stops written with C are actually the paudal stops. Cha. The two characters which require extra special mention are shown now. Ah and ah. Maybe. The truth is, there are disagreements about what these were in Old Tibetan. If you've ever looked at modern Tibetan, you know that the latter is now a glottal stop word initially, and the former is just a vowel without a consonant, but this is actually not how it started out. 
In fact, the former in Old Tibetan may have signified a glottal stop, while the latter was either simply vocalic onset, that is, the absence of a glottal stop or other consonant, or a voiced velar fricative, or prenasalization of the following consonant. I will note that if the latter is not vocalic onset, then glottal stop is not phonemic and the former is just the only way to start a syllable without a consonant. The historic pronunciation of this second character is particularly controversial. Initially I was going to avoid talking about it, but I actually had a lot of fun looking into these characters while researching this video, so I'll include a bit on these fellows here and talk about their evolution later in the video. In any case, in Old Tibetan, these two characters presented a distinction that is not present in the Old Indic alphabets, so their distinctive presence was an innovation of the Tibetans. As you can see from the two example words, they are indeed distinct from each other as phonemes. For now, I will be treating the second character as if it represents vocalic onset, that is, the lack of a glottal stop, although again, some people have different ideas. The reason I've chosen to think of it as vocalic onset instead is that it is a bit more instructive when looking at certain orthographic ideas that I'll talk about later. Also, even if in Old Tibetan this character represented a velar fricative, it had stopped being pronounced this way by the times of Classical Tibetan when these orthographic reforms had taken place. My third reason I'll tell you in like a minute. So Bayer argued that the former character is the glottal stop and the latter represents vocalic onset. Now as I said, Sanskrit had no phonemic glottal stop so it did not distinguish between those sounds. The separation of these characters was an innovation of the Tibetans. In the Indic alphabets they depicted their vowels as diacritics written on or under or around their consonants, and if they ever wanted to write or say a vowel in isolation, they would just show that diacritic on a sort of null consonant depicting the absence of a consonant. You'll soon see that in Tibetan they also write their vowels using diacritics, but in order to depict vowels in isolation, they use the diacritic in conjunction with the glottal stop character. This is likely because they wanted to emulate the Sanskriters. As I said, in Sanskrit there is no phonemic glottal stop at the beginning of consonants, but if asked to pronounce the sound ah, they would likely pronounce it as I did, with a glottal stop in the beginning. Speakers of English as well as modern Hindi certainly do this. So ancient Tibetans associated the standard Sanskrit vocalic onset with their glottal stop ah. Even though it technically begins with a consonant according to Tibetan phonology, they both wrote and said their vowel names like this just to emulate the Sanskritman. This is so silly, I just love it. It's kind of like how in English we say that the short I sound is I, or the short E sound is E. It just makes no sense. So this brings me to my third reason why I want to believe that this second character is vocalic onset. It just makes this silly tidbit a lot more fun. Now again, in modern Tibetan their roles are more or less switched from this model, with the former being a high tone vocalic onset and the latter being low tone and often carrying a glottal stop. So in the romanization system, which you'll see in italics, the old Tibetan glottal stop character is indicated by the lack of a consonant, and the old Tibetan vocalic onset character is indicated by an apostrophe, which is a standard symbol for the glottal stop, because this suits their modern Tibetan roles. In the transliterations you'll see for Old Tibetan words, I've decided to keep using this modern romanization system because this is the only thing that is inaccurate about the Wiley system as far as how it works with Old Tibetan phonology, so I think it would be more confusing than helpful to switch just that one thing for just half of the video. So be sure to remember that and look at the not quite IPA pronunciations between the slash marks to confirm. Now these 30 radicals were obviously not enough to represent all the sounds of Old Tibetan. The language has five vowels, a, i, u, e, o, as well as consonant clusters. The older Indic scripts existed for languages with primarily open syllables. While there were ways to combine characters, they did not need so many ways as Tibetan, which had both complex onset clusters and complex codas. The writing system dealt with this by representing each syllable not as one character, but as potentially several, with each syllable separated by a dot, which is what you see after every radical in the chart. The vowels were represented by diacritics on the main radical, and the consonant clusters were realized as other consonants placed above, below, or on either side of the main radical. The main radical on which the vowel diacritic was placed served as the main sound, ta. Glide consonants can be subscripted to occur right after or as a part of the radical consonant, for example, gya is a palatalized ga. Retroflex ra, dentalish la, 
labial wa and palatal ya glides can be subscripted to be pronounced after the radical consonant but before the vowel. For the linguists among you, these subscripted consonants are usually formally post-initial, but not always. In fact, la subscripts are almost always initial such that the radical consonant is actually pre-initial. We know this for a few reasons, but in the video we'll actually see evidence of this with how consonant clusters simplify. The rest of the subscripts are typically truly post-initial to my knowledge. There is some contention as to whether they may be initial in certain situations, but I'll assume not in this video. Note that it is possible for wa to be subscripted after another consonant to have a potential total of two glides or glide accompanied by labialization. For example, the word for school is slobgra, which I dare to say with the hope that there are no 8th century Tibetans in the comments to rag on my pronunciation. The more sonorous sounds, ra, la, and sa, can be superscripted to be pronounced right before the main consonant, for example in gargyal. Five characters, ga, ba, da, ma, and the vocalic onset, can be prefixed, for example in dbong, power. You might be asking how the vocalic onset can serve as a prefix. Some argue that even as a vocalic onset character, it could have been pronounced as prenasalization in this pre-radical position, and of course you're welcome to be in the velar fricative camp, but I'll get to some more functions a bit later. As I said, controversial character. Ten characters, the stops da, ga, ba, as well as ra, la, sa, vocalic onset, and the nasals ma, na, nga, can be put in suffix position to be pronounced after the vowel. Notice no palatal consonants can be in this position. Two characters, the dental, laviol, or whatever, da, and sa, could serve as a second suffix to be pronounced after the first suffix, like in gur. So the theoretical maximum number of characters in one syllable was eight. One radical, one vowel diacritic, one superscribed, two subscribed, one prefixed, and two suffixed. Although the actual maximum is seven, two subscripts do not occur at the same time as a superscript. I will also note that there are some extra shenanigans that can be done in order to translate Sanskrit words for the purposes of Buddhist writings or whatever. For example, you can reverse characters to get some retroflex consonants, or you can add ha as a subscript to get voiced aspirated consonants, thus completing the Sanskrit four-way voice aspiration distinction. It's nothing too crazy, but I'm going to ignore it in the name of this video's brevity. There are a couple controversial combinations, though. The consonant la superscripted over ha and the combination ha with a ra subscript are potentially not actually consonant clusters. Hill claims they are voiceless counterparts to la and ra, whereas Bayer claims they are, indeed, clusters. So in conclusion, an Old Tibetan syllable consists of a main radical consonant and a vowel combined with, optionally, a prefix and superscript pronounced pre-initially, a subscript pronounced post-initially, or again as the initial sound in the case of la, as well as two suffixes that make up the coda. I'll take this as an opportunity to note that there are voicing and aspiration distinctions only in the radical consonant. The pre-initial consonants actually copy the voicing of the radical, and the suffix stops are always voiced. The possible consonant clusters for each position are shown in this slide. Phonotactically, not all of these syllables are actually possible, but I won't get too into phonotactics here. If you want to know more, leave a comment or something, maybe I'll make a video about it, or just refer you to a good source. I'll talk a little bit about the prefixes and superscripts, though. Note that the set of superscripted and prefixed characters differ from each other. This is why they used separate slots to represent them. Clearly, the ancient folks had thought about syllable structure and the differences between these sets of consonants. So based only on this, we know that pre-initially the stops must come before the glides fricative la, ra, sa. I will also say that the labial stop ba is the only prefix that co-occurs with a superscript meaning that any word with two pre-initial consonants must start with ba. The linguists among you might ask if what I just said might not hold true if a subscripted la causes the radical to be pre-initial. In fact, a subscripted la never co-occurs with a superscript. This, incidentally, is one of the factors pointing to the idea that a subscripted la is initial. So if your dream was to bring all the pre-initial consonants together for one big jamboree, I'm sorry, but it's not gonna happen. A few more notes for the linguists among you. The series romanized with C represents palatal stops. The sounds written as alveolar affricates, tsa, tsa, za, 
are thought to be dental affricates because of how they are traditionally presented and written, and the palatal consonants are just characterized as their palatalized forms rather than separate phonemes. The only reason they were given separate characters is that they were separate phonemes in the Indic languages. This is why the palatal nasals or stops cannot appear as a prefix or suffix, and why the dental affricates never appear with the palatal glide ya as a subscript. This trend of people analyzing the Tibetan language through the lens of Sanskrit grammar, which you've now seen a couple examples of already, is pretty pervasive throughout history and persists in many ways to this day. So this is a perfectly fine Abu Gita as it stands. There are actually only a few phonemic inaccuracies, which we've already talked about. The separate characters for the paddles, the often subscripted initial law, and the potential non-clusters that are written as clusters. The complications come when we fast forward 1200 years and see that Tibetan is no longer pronounced the same way, but is still written exactly the same. To put the evolution in very general terms, the consonant clusters and codas have greatly simplified, and the language has developed tones to make up for this. Now, I will say as a disclaimer that when I say modern Tibetan, I am referring to modern standard Tibetan, which is based on the modern dialect spoken in Lhasa. Furthermore, I am mostly going to ignore casual speech, which is sometimes gonna gonna want to differ from the standard don't you know. In languages, tones often arise in exchange for something else. A brief explanation of what happens is that as people pronounce certain, for example, initial consonants, they will pronounce the vowels immediately following those consonants with a higher or lower tone, depending on the consonant. Often, tautness in consonants is reanalyzed as a high tone, whereas breathiness or looseness of consonants is reanalyzed as a low tone. Then, something else happens to the phonology, perhaps a loss in distinction in initial consonants or consonant clusters, while the tone stays, thus making it phonemic. In other words, at this point, two syllables can differ only in tone because the conditions that cause the tones to develop has disappeared. The same idea applies to the end of tones, too. Consonants at the end of syllables can cause the preceding vowels to raise or lower, and this is what leads to tone contours. The evolution of tones in Tibetan is pretty textbook. Tibetan specifically lost its initial consonant voicing distinction and its consonant clusters, and exchanged these for tones. Generally, Tibetan voiced consonants were reanalyzed as low tones, and unvoiced consonants were reanalyzed as high tones. Now, if you look at the modern Tibetan alphabet, this tidbit is actually almost enough to write down the new alphabet completely. Characters which corresponded to voiceless consonants in the old alphabet now are unaffected save for the overline signifying a high tone, and characters which corresponded to voiced consonants are now written as their unvoiced equivalents but carrying a low tone. Thus far, this voicing tone rule has not been broken. I'll specifically note that the tones of the former vocalic onset and glottal stop character also match up with the expected, whether the former is thought of as a vocalic onset, voiced velar fricative, and or prenasalization. This voice brings low tone, voiceless brings high tone distinction applies not only to the stops, but to the fricatives and liquids as well. What was za has changed to a low tone sa, and what was sa has changed to a high tone sa. Note that in modern Tibetan, non-aspirated low-tone consonants are pronounced as voiced consonants, so that low-tone sa is actually pronounced as an voiced za, but this is not phonemic and is seen as much less important in modern Tibetan than the ideas of aspiration and tone. There is no low-tone sa or high-tone za. Now, the only thing in this initial chart which runs counter to expectation based on the little information I already gave you is that these low tone characters are aspirated, whereas before they were voiced unaspirated. But there are never any aspirated voiced consonants in Tibetan, so this is not a change that interferes with anything and isn't entirely strange. But remember I said that low tone non-aspirated consonants were pronounced as voiced, Indeed, these low-tone aspirated consonants are actually pronounced as voiceless, but this shouldn't strike you as too strange. I don't really have any data to back this up, but I think voiced aspirated consonants are the rarest of the classic four-way distinction, and it makes sense that they would lose their voice. Again, voicing is just allophonic in modern Tibetan, so it isn't seen as super important, and so it's super easy for it to be gained and lost, and often, even in modern casual speech, low-tone stops can be pronounced as voiced, unvoiced, or mid-voiced, with no loss in comprehension. Now, don't get too comfortable with these tones yet, because of course voicing distinction is not the only thing which modern Tibetan has lost. It also lost lots of consonant clusters, and these can affect the tones of syllables. 
In general terms, often consonant clusters can affect the perceived tautness of a syllable and thus cause the tone to raise, and of course, consonant clusters can do other things like affect aspiration. We'll also see that there's a sort of tone contour, wherein coda consonants can cause the end of a vowel to lower in tone as well. Now, rather than explain all this stuff at once, I'm just going to go on a second tour of the Tibetan syllable, this time under the rules of modern Tibetan phonology, to see exactly how these changes happened. But one more thing I'll say here because there's not a better place to put it. Remember when I said in the old Tibetan phonology, voicing and aspiration is not distinguished after the first syllable of a word? Then logically it would make sense that tones would not develop in the modern language for second syllable stops, and this is completely true. In fact, tone only applies to the first syllable of a word as well as aspiration and voicing distinctions. So it's still true that the stops in the same place of articulation, or rather in the same row of the chart, will generally be pronounced the same when not word initial. I don't think I have a sufficient reason to go against the most immediately canonical path through the syllables, so we'll first take a look at the prefixes. Here we're going to see that word initial clusters simplify in exchange for tones, which I've already alluded to. I'll also repeat a general rule about tones, that taut consonants bring high tones and loose consonants bring low tones. So in modern Tibetan, word initial clusters are simplified such that pre-initial consonants, including prefixes, are not actually pronounced at the start of a word. But they do affect the aspiration of the following initial consonant. If the following consonant is a low tone aspirated stop, it will lose its aspiration. Remember that low tone non aspirated consonants are pronounced as voiced, so this means that prefixes voice the consonants as well. But again, voicing is no longer an important or phonemic feature of the language, the important features are tone and aspiration. This loss of aspiration may seem random, but there is a close to home analog that I will repeat. In my dialect of English, stops are often aspirated when they occur word initial or begin a stressed syllable, and otherwise unaspirated. For example, I pronounced pit with an aspirated P, but spit with an unaspirated P. Apply this logic to our knowledge of Tibetan, and you see that while these consonant prefixes eventually lost their direct pronunciations, they first prevented the low tone stops from becoming aspirated. Now, this actually doesn't happen for the high tone aspirated stops, so onset prefixes do not affect their pronunciation or the pronunciation of high tone unaspirated stops. As for why this doesn't occur with the high tone aspirated stops when it does occur with the low tones, the truth is I don't really have any intuition here other than the fact that high tones already distinguish aspiration, so this sort of allophonic variation could not occur so freely with these high tones. In any case, we see that these two verb forms are spelled differently, reflecting a different Old Tibetan pronunciation, but are now pronounced the same, to. Again, the H in that phonetic spelling indicates aspiration, so that's an aspirated stop rather than a dental fricative. I'm not using true IPA, but I hope the written pronunciations between the bars is self-evident enough that I don't need to explain it. Prefixes have one other general effect in modern Tibetan. I said earlier that taut consonants tend to be reanalyzed as high tones, and we see this as prefixes in initial position raise the tone of nasals and glides. Again, in loose logical terms, having a busier initial consonant in Old Tibetan can be seen as more taut, and causes the following consonant to have a bit higher tone. Think about the Old Tibetan gnam and the simple syllable na next to one another. As I already said, the na in modern Tibetan now carries a low tone, which makes sense as it's a voice syllable and certainly not a taut one. Contrasting with this, the prefixed consonant in gnam makes the initial consonant feel sharper and more taut, and so when the initial consonant cluster disappeared, it was reanalyzed as a high tone. This happens with all nasals and glides. I'll note that in the word for neck, nya, the period in this romanization reflects that this is a prefixed ga followed by a palatal glide, and is not a radical consonant ga with a subscripted palatal glide. Phonetically, this means that the palatal glide ya is the initial consonant with a pre-initial velar stop ga, rather than an initial consonant ga which is palatalized with a palatal glide post-initial. These two things were pronounced differently in Old Tibetan and actually evolved to have different pronunciations in the modern language, which we'll see when we get to the subscripts. This is probably one of the reasons why Tibetan seems much more confusing in romanization, as you can't immediately see the difference between superscripts, subscripts, prefixes, and radicals. Now there's one more prefix rule that I'm going to point out. It's a bit more crazy and only actually applies to one constant combination. The cluster of the pre-initial alveolar stop followed by the initial labial stop behaves very strangely in modern Tibetan. 
it has turned into a high tone labial approximant wa. To be honest, I'm not entirely sure what to say about this change. It seems the labial stop ba was softened into an approximant and the pre-initial alveolar stop was removed while causing a high tone according to the standard rule. There are other instances of the consonant ba turning into a labial glide, notably as we'll see later in the video, in the second syllable an onset ba regularly softens into wa. But as for this word initial cluster, I've actually looked around a lot for a source giving some intermediate steps or something like that, but frustratingly I haven't been able to find anything. If any of y'all have a source on this, let me know. In any case, we have that this cluster has turned into a high tone wa. Other related combinations are now shown on the screen, but they all make sense given the combinations we have just discussed. The cluster with vowels other than a are just pronounced as a normal high tone vowel without any labial approximate. This is actually generally true that the labial glide wa followed by any vowel other than a disappears in modern Tibetan. As for the combinations featuring a labial approximate with the post-initial rhotic ra, it turns out that the labial glide has disappeared and it is just pronounced as ra. You'll see that this is regular when we talk about subscripts, but intuitively the cluster of a labial approximate followed by ra has simplified to ra because the rhotic is more visible in that sound. Similarly, it's very reasonable that this cluster with a subscripted ya would simplify into ya. I won't dwell on this cluster too much, and I won't talk about it again after this section, so after I talk about the subscripts, feel free to go back and look at this again. So maybe that last part was a bit confusing, but now you can relax for a bit because the superscripts do the exact same thing. This shouldn't be a surprise seeing as the prefixes and superscripts fill more or less the same role, both being consonants that are pronounced before the main radical. The only real difference is that the superscripts are generally more sonorous and they can appear after the prefix ba, but as far as their role in the modern language goes, they still have the same effects on tone and aspiration as the prefixes do. So they cause high tones on nasals and ya in the same way, and they remove the aspiration on low tone stops. It's also true that clusters featuring two pre-initial consonants, that is, labial ba followed by a superscript followed by a radical, are still generally simplified into just that initial consonant with the two pre-initials now unpronounced. In other words, even if you have a prefix as well as a superscript, they still won't be pronounced. Nothing else to explain here, so I'll move on. Now, the subscripts aren't quite so easy, but we can still make do with the general rules we've already seen. As we saw before, the glides ya, ra, wa, and la can be subscripted in Old Tibetan to denote the pronunciation of that glide between the radical consonant and the vowel. Of the four subscripts, wa is the easiest to deal with. In Old Tibetan, it corresponded to a post-initial labial glide. Well, sometime around the 9th century, that glide was lost, and this subscript does nothing. It isn't pronounced, and it never affects tone or aspiration. As far as the modern language is concerned, it's just a homophone distinguisher. Loss of labialization isn't too rare in languages. Modern Greek, for example, has lost the labial approximant entirely. The palatal glide ya subscript still represents palatalization. Using ya with the velar stops just palatalizes, so we get ya. But more notably, using ya with labial stops just palatalizes into the corresponding palatal stop. So bya in the old phonology is now pronounced cha in the word bird. These are the only consonants that can be written with the ya palatal glide, so we are done. The next subscript I'll talk about is the alveolar glide la. In this case, every consonant but one subscripted with la just ends up being a high tone la. This actually isn't strange at all. Recall when I said that a subscripted la is usually initial rather than postnitial. This essentially means that it would have been more proper for Old Tibetans to write these subscripted laws as the main radical. They just didn't quite catch this fact. I don't know enough about Old Sanskrit grammarians to say whether or not this was due to Indic influence, but for whatever the reason, this mistake was made, and this initial consonant is often written as a subscript. Knowing this, this sound change makes complete sense in the context of everything we know about the phonology. While the subscripts wa and ya were glides pronounced after the main consonant, the subscript la is more formally the main consonant at the end of the word initial cluster, and thus the radicals disappeared to simplify the consonant cluster. It's entirely predictable then that, since the radical is a sound that occurs before the main sound, it ends up raising the tone as well. To rephrase, the radical above the la subscript just acts as if it were a prefix. But recall again that I said la is almost always initial when written as a subscript. Indeed, there is one exception to this rule. When la is written as a subscript to the old Tibetan voiced alveolar fricative za, it was actually likely formally post-initial. 
so this cluster behaves differently. In modern Tibetan, it is pronounced as a low-tone, unaspirated da. This certainly seems strange, but to provide some background, Bayer hypothesizes that the old Tibetan onset zla went through metathesis to form ulza. Then the voiced fricative za strengthened to a stop to form ulda. And finally, the initial la was removed to get the simplified non-cluster da. Note that it often ends up being pre-nasalized after certain consonants too, which makes sense given this proposed path and given what we'll discuss later in the video. So there's only one subscript left, ra. This one, when applied to a stop, just turns that stop into a retroflex stop, tra. The Old Tibetan retroflex ra articulated while, for example, ga, sounds a lot like the same motion with the point of articulation at where the tongue is curled up. Gra, tra. So, through time, the point of articulation changed and they all just morphed into retroflex plosives, which did not exist in Old Tibetan. So now we can finally pronounce the second syllable in the word for school, lobtra. Ra can also occur subscripted under sa, sha, ma, and ha. As we said earlier, ra subscripted under ha is possibly just a voiceless retroflex glide in the old phonology, and this is what it is today. To the other three, it raises the tone but is not pronounced. Note the first two already have high tone, so no pronunciation distinction arises. So the only effect is that ma, ra, a is pronounced as a high tone ma. I think this makes enough sense as it is in light of the consonant cluster changes we've seen so far, so I won't get too far into this. There's some speculation in Bayer's book that there's some strange metathesis shenanigans going on here as well, but I'll leave that to you if you feel like reading about it. So that's the end of the subscribed consonants, and we only have two positions left. The suffixes behave a lot more normally with respect to the romanization, so we're through the hard part. That having been said, we are now dealing with codas rather than onset clusters, so we have to add another two general rules to our condensed handbook. Namely, coda, or post-vowel consonants, undergo lenition, and post-vowel tongue-articulated front consonants, front and back vowels. There are ten first suffixes, and for the most part, they are either pronounced as normal or softened to glottal stops. We immediately see this with ba and ga. Ba is pronounced, but it may also be a glottal stop, the same is true for ka. A glottal stop is essentially just a very quick stopping of the airflow with your glottis. Native English speakers do this in the middle of the word uh-oh. Note that the glottal stop as a sound is very similar to the sound created if you start the articulation of a stop like ba or ga, but just don't finish the sound out of native laziness. Instead of saying la ba, you just say la. This is a softening or lenition of sounds, and as I said, it happens in the coda. Over time, this just turns into a glottal stop. So, words ending with a stop in Old Tibetan will typically end with a glottal stop in Modern Tibetan. But note that if there is a second syllable, the consonants will often stay pronounced. This also makes intuitive sense if you try to say the syllable lock in the aforementioned lazy way, but follow it with pa. So instead of that unfinished ka sounding like a glottal stop in lock, the continued articulation makes that ka finish completely and you end up with lock pa or so it happened in Tibetan. In other languages, stops can turn into glottal stops even in the middle of the word, or as they would be called in some varieties of English, glottal stops. So while this might seem intimidating, this sound change isn't so abnormal. And we have lu sheep, but lokpa, hand. The first one with a glottal stop, and the second one with a velar stop. There's a little bit more nuance to these coda consonants than what I'm expressing here, but we don't have all day. Now, I hope you're comfortable with that sound change, as the sa and da suffixes always turn into glottal stops. These are both alveolar consonants, and the intuition is pretty much the same as for the last two stops, but to give some more examples of alveolar stops being softened from English, we have the words beret, which admittedly is a French origin, which is notorious for its silent letters, as well as the word Arkansas, which used to be called Arkansas. There's one more thing about these two consonants that I have not yet mentioned. These consonants cause back vowels a, u, o to be fronted. This is because sa and da are articulated in the front of the mouth. Your tongue is touching the alveolar ridge near your teeth when you say them. The vowels a, u, o are called back vowels because the raised part of your tongue is in the back of the mouth when they are pronounced. So back when these consonants were fully articulated, native speakers got lazy, and instead of pronouncing the rigid lod, which requires the back of your tongue to be in the bottom back of your mouth and transition to the top front of your mouth, they nativified this to lid, bringing this back vowel to the front of the mouth. This is not an uncommon sound change, think of the German umlaut ol. 
And then, of course, after this umlaut occurred, the sa and da went through that lenition we talked about and turned into glottal stops. Note that this causes an interesting distinction. Remember that the ga suffix also turned into a glottal stop in many cases. So, for example, the word luk, sheep, and the word lut, manure, the coda is a glottal stop in both cases, but they are actually pronounced differently in that the back vowel of the latter word was fronted. So what once is a distinction in ending consonant between two words has evolved into a distinction in vowel quality. Isn't that fun? Now, this is pretty much all we need to get through the rest of the suffixes. The nasals nga and na and ma are pronounced, and of course cause nasalization of vowels. In addition to this, the alveolar nasal na fronts back vowels in the same way that the other alveolar consonants do. It has the same place of articulation as da and sa, so this shouldn't be surprising. Ra and la are both sometimes pronounced, particularly if the speaker is enunciating very clearly, but otherwise just end up lengthening the vowel. This makes sense. Essentially, people are just lazy and don't fully articulate the r or ul, but still have the word take the same amount of time, thus resulting in a vowel lengthening. This is actually another form of consonant lenition, so it fits right in with our guidebook. The tenth and final suffix is our favorite character that we don't actually know what it was. In coda position, this character actually doesn't normally have any effect in the modern language. It underwent our favorite process, lenition, and disappeared entirely. So while coda consonants like ba and ga were softened to glottal stops, this little fellow was softened right out of the lexicon. There are some situations where this character actually does have an effect. I've decided to talk about it at the end of the video though, so let's move on. Now the second suffixes are actually pretty easy. The only consonants which can appear as second suffixes are da and sa. If they appear after a nasal, they will appear as a glottal stop, just as we already discussed they did without a nasal. A nasal pronounced after a vowel is very similar to a vowel, so further cluster simplification need not occur. After other consonants, however, the consonant clusters do simplify and these are just not pronounced. Additionally, as second suffixes, da and sa will not cause umlaut like they do as first suffixes, as the articulation of the consonant immediately before them blocks such phonological change. Now I will say something that is very sad that the second suffix da used to be written but disappeared around the 10th century after a decree from some king who wanted to simplify the spelling. So you typically won't see this da suffix written. However, it still affects pronunciation, and there are even suffixes in Tibetan that change forms based on the final letter of the word that agree with the now unwritten final da instead of the final consonant which actually is written. It's quite unfortunate because this is just about the only such instance of a spelling reform which takes the language away from its historical pronunciation norm, and it causes some unpredictability that has no business happening. It sucks. Now, I wasn't entirely sure when best to introduce this topic, but I'll quickly go through it now. When I talked about the emergence of tones in Tibetan, I said that consonants affected the tone of the vowel near them. So far, I've only talked about this as it applies to the beginning of syllables, but it also applies to the end of syllables to create tone contour. Essentially, in monosyllabic words, syllables that end with a vowel or nasal have a mostly even contour, while syllables that end with a stop fall in tone at the end of a syllable. So the existence of these second suffixes after nasals also affects tone contour. While a word ending with a nasal has an even contour, a word ending with a nasal and second suffix actually ends with a glottal stop which brings the tone down to a falling contour. Obviously this is not phonemic, as it is completely dependent on the final consonant, but I felt wrong not mentioning it. So now we can finally start talking about the second syllables. You might have noticed that I talked a lot about initial onset clusters, but not about medial onset clusters. Here, onset refers to the clusters being before a vowel, so initial onset clusters occur at the beginning of a word, and medial onset clusters occur before a vowel in the middle of a word. So they occur in between syllables. In fact, it's a general rule in Tibetan that medial onset clusters do not simplify so much. But this is pretty normal. As an example, English is known for having some crazy consonant clusters, like in the word twelfths. But our initial consonant clusters are actually very simple. The most you'll ever see is three, like in the word straight. The reason for this should be intuitive. Consonants starting out a word don't have the tail end of a vowel to latch onto. In Tibetan, while we have seen that word initial consonant clusters are very simplified, with the prefixes and superscripts generally only affecting tone and aspiration, this is not quite so extreme in the second syllable when these consonants are sometimes pronounced. 
Also, I've actually already talked about something like this already when I said that the stop suffixes ba and ga were normally glottal stops if they end a word, but are often pronounced if in the middle of a word. The same applies to these sounds in prefix position. Obviously, as word initial prefixes, they only affect tone and aspiration, but as prefixes in the middle of a word, they are pronounced just as if they were a suffix. So we have lobzang. Again, note that these prefixes are not simplified because the preceding vowel allows them to be pronounced without much difficulty and without making the word significantly more awkward to say, whereas pronouncing them in a word initial position feels very awkward. To see this, just try pronouncing in the old Tibetan way bzong versus lobzong. The second syllable in the latter example then feels much more natural because the pre-initial labial stop ba can ride on that tailing vowel o. Phonetic evolution is often just based on making things easier to say like this. I'll give a little bit of extra intuition for this for any French speakers out there. French is obviously known for having a bunch of silent consonants at the end of words that are pronounced if followed by a vowel or h, but silent otherwise. A super common one is the second person plural vous in French. Usually the s at the end is silent, the same if you follow it with a consonant like avez-vous peur, but to say for example you have, one would say vous avez pronouncing the s at the end of the word because the phonological conditions applied to that historical ending s are different. So I'll give a quick summary for the rest of the prefixes. The alveolar nasal na in the former vocalic onset character are often pronounced as nasals which are assimilated to the radical consonant. For example, the glottal stop character in the auxiliary mindu is pronounced as the alveolar nasal na because that is the nasal at the same place of articulation as the following radical da. The labial nasal ma can also be pronounced, but tends not to be assimilated. The prefix da will never be pronounced in the second syllable. This shouldn't be too surprising as it's always unpronounced or softened to a glottal stop in the coda, along with the suffix sa. Speaking of the suffix sa, it occurs as a superscript, and all of this stuff I said about prefixes sometimes being pronounced in the second syllable also applies to superscripts for the exact same reasons. Although of course sa is never pronounced, and to my knowledge a superscripted la is never pronounced, a superscripted ra in certain circumstances can be. Anyways, that's the end of the prefixes, so I just have one final exception and we'll wrap it up. In the second syllable, the labial stop ba as a radical is normally pronounced as the labial approximate wa, especially after vowels. This is just normal lenition from a labial stop to a labial approximant, and if you remember that crazy shenanigans with Old Tibetan dba clusters simplifying to wa, this is just that, but it makes more sense. Now I'll talk a bit more about our favorite two characters. As I said, the Old Tibetan glottal stop character has actually softened to a high tone vocalic onset in the modern language and does not appear as anything but a radical. The former vocalic onset consonant in modern Tibetan is pronounced as a low tone vocalic onset, or sometimes as a glottal stop, when it's a radical, and I said in the section on suffixes that when it appears as a suffix, it usually has no effect. But there are some situations where this character actually does have an effect as a suffix, and a pretty important one. This is a character with a very interesting history. I'll remind you that there are some different theories as to what this character actually did, whether it signified vocalic onset or prenasalization or a velar fricative, but whatever its initial pronunciation was, Bayer argues that after the 9th century it had lost that pronunciation and began to be used as a sort of placeholder character that indicated the lack of a consonant in a few different ways. First, when used normally as a suffix, it could be used to mark the lack of a consonant in coda position. The idea is this character can only appear as a prefix or a first suffix and never as a second suffix. So in the words shown on the screen, because you see it in final position, you know that na and ga are the radicals in those words shown on the screen, whereas if the suffix were not written in either of those words, they would only have two characters in them and you would not know if they were a prefix followed by a radical or a radical followed by a suffix unless you knew the words, because all of those characters can appear both as a prefix and a suffix. So the vocalic onset character started being used like this, not with a function of being pronounced, but with a function of clarifying the other characters in a word. The second possible function of this character is also related to depicting the lack of a consonant, namely depicting diphthongs. Now Sanskrit actually did have a couple of diphthongs which were kind of just long vowels, but they were written as single characters with multiple diacritics. Now, Old Tibetan was also not brimming with diphthongs, in fact, Hill claims it had only one, which was a shortening of a genitive suffix, 
But in any case, as the writing system continued, Tibetans did not use single characters like those Sanskrit lads. They actually had a few different ways to depict diphthongs, either writing them as multiple syllables or including only the second vowel in the writing. But the way that this eventually was standardized in the 9th century was to use this vocalic onset character along with a vowel diacritic in suffix position. Here it represents the lack of a consonant carrying a vowel. There's only one syllable written, as there is only one syllable ending dot, but there is a consonantless character carrying a vowel at the end, and this is how diphthongs are realized after the 9th century. So if you wanted to write a name like Mao, you could do that. And if any of y'all are familiar with modern or classical Tibetan, you know that this character carrying the E vowel is often used as a genitive case suffix after a vowel. Honestly, I wasn't initially intending to talk about these two characters so much. I actually had a script for this video with almost no info on these guys, but I did some last minute research that ended up significantly pushing back this video's recording. There's so much interesting history to talk about here, way more than I can fit into this video, so I'll just stop here. I think making another video on these characters, as well as some of the tools old Tibetans used to translate Sanskrit and Chinese words, would be really interesting to research and create, but it's just too much to include in this video. So in conclusion, it's hard to tack on specific pronunciations to modern Tibetan characters. Their pronunciations change heavily based on their positions in a syllable, as well as their positions within the word. But I hope that after watching the video thus far that you see tacking on pronunciations to consonant characters is not the right approach to thinking about the modern Tibetan script for these reasons. While it's easy to make the alphabet seem esoteric and illogical by trying to force this phenome-based approach onto an alphabet that no longer suits it, a better way to think about the Tibetan system is to keep in mind how it evolved to be the way it is. To associate consonants with archaic pronunciations on which a set of phonetic changes is applied to get the modern pronunciation. With such an approach, the alphabet is logical and elegant, and I would argue it's quite fun to study as well. In any case, that's a crash course in the phonological evolution of Tibetan. Now I was planning at this time to go through some interesting ramifications of this writing system as well as the phonological evolution in general on the Tibetan language, but I think this video has gotten a bit long and I've elected to make less of it. There's no minimum like the absolute, so I'm going to end the video now and hit some of those talking points in a follow-up video that should be coming out pretty soon maybe.